I'm not camera ready. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to All About Eagles. I'm Melissa Yapel. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let you know what is in the lineup for next month in case you want to join us for any of our exciting webinars that we have lined up. Um, they're always Wednesdays at 10 a.m. with our naturalists from Ohio State Parks. Um, so if you want to join us next month on the 6th, we're going to be doing a uh, Raising Fish 101. And on the 13th, Winter Bird Feeding Tips and Tricks. Um, on the 20th, we'll be talking about Nature's Architect. And if you're not sure who that is, that is the American Beaver. And on the 27th, we will be teaching you how to identify all of um, Ohio's woodpeckers. There's seven of them that call Ohio home. So I hope that you can join us then. I don't want to waste much time getting started today because I know that this is a very popular webinar we have. So I'm going to introduce, um, oh, before I introduce our presenters, if you have questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A box. We are happy to answer um, all the questions that we can. Uh, we will try to get to all of them before the end of the program. But with that, um, I have with me Catherine Connor. She's from Houston Woods. State Park. Uh, there's Catherine and she might show you a live eagle later. We'll see. Um, and then we have with us Aaron Shaw from Caesar Creek State Park. And so Aaron is going to be kicking it off for us today. So go ahead and take it away, Aaron. All right. Well, thank you for having us today. I'm really excited. This topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, because I have been seeing the eagles return and they are in our parks. And the first time I ever saw an eagle was, was here at the Nature Center. I was out at the end of the gate, you know, opening the Nature Center gate and it flew like right over my head. And it was just amazing the first time because as a, as a kid, you know, I, I never saw them growing up. And just in the recent, say like past, five years or so, eight years, they really have have returned. And it's the most amazing success story that I can think of. But what my, my takeaway from studying the bald eagles and seeing this, like actually experiencing this in my lifetime is to realize what an impact humans make. Like one person can truly, truly make a difference. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Like, how can you help? How can you get involved? And the tremendous impact that humans have had with the bald eagle population. Um, so we'll talk about that kind of at the end. And the middle part, as we mentioned, um, Catherine will be here with, with her live eagle. And then to start off with, we're going to talk about the description like bald eagles in general. So I do have some pictures that I'd like to share with you. And let me see if I can find them here. Can you see my screen? Um, I see your screen, but it's all just red, red little icons right now. So I don't know if you can enlarge Click and enlarge one of them. We might be able to see it. Okay. There we go. Okay. These these photos were taken by Marlon Carr. So Marlon, thank you so much for sharing your photography with me and with the park. Um, and I would like to thank all the photographers. There's a really neat Facebook page if you're out there, uh, Carillon Park, the Eagle page that they have. I've really learned a lot actually watching that Facebook page because they have a a good view uh, and they're at a safe distance. So that's that's really important with photographers. Um, and you know, thank you for being respectful with that. The description of the bald eagle. So if I click on enlarge this picture here. Um, of course, they are they're very large birds. I, you don't realize how big they are until you're like up next to one. They're huge and 
The males and the females both have the white head and the white tail. They have yellow beaks and yellow feet. They have the golden eyes and their bodies are a, a rich like chocolate brown color. And the females are bigger than the males. They look identical, but they're, they're bigger. And once you start watching the eagles, they all kind of have their unique characteristics. Like one might have a little bit of a uh, more black, you know, or you can start to see the just slight variations. Um, so uh, the juveniles look like this. They are all brown and when they're first born, they're little fuzzy white cotton balls. And then as they start to grow, they look kind of like big ugly crows in the nest. And they have like black beaks. I'm not really sure when they turn yellow, but their beaks are a different color when they're babies. And then as they grow, it takes them about five or six years before they get their white head and their white tail. So the juveniles can often be mistaken for like a turkey vulture. And so you want to be looking for the, the way that they fly and the shape of their wings. So the bald eagle's wingspan is uh, much more straight across. And a turkey vulture has a more of a V shape when it's flying up in the sky. So you want to, to look for that. Um, a lot of people ask, where can you see the eagles? And the best time to see them is, is in the winter time. But again, you want to keep your distance because that's when they are, are nesting. It, in the winter, because the, the leaves are off the trees, and it's easier to see. So bring your binoculars, you know, your, your big scope lens and uh, find a good spot and, and stay back. If during the summertime, I do see them a lot just flying around in the sky. I'll see them in the north part of the lake and in the south part of the lake. Um, but actually I'll see them flying all over. I see them flying across the marina, you know, they're, there's a bunch of them here. And in the last, say, five years, I guess, there's been one or a pair nesting close by. And last year they hatched three. And the year before that they hatched three. And the year before that they hatched two. So there's a good population of them right here. Uh, and I do see them often. Um, my my first time seeing them, like I said, was at the Nature Center gate and it flew right over my head and uh, then I was seeing them up in the sky. And then the second time I was actually close to one where I got to encounter it was um, uh, we were doing the Christmas bird count and, you know, we're all out there being very quiet and counting birds. Everybody has their clipboards and the body was in the backyard of the Nature Center. And uh, I saw it and I'm like, ah! and all the birds flew away. But uh, that, was, <laughs> that was my second time seeing one really up close. They are amazing. And if you keep your eye out while you're near the park or even driving out along the roads here, you might see one. Um, we hope you do actually, we hope that you do see them. And so during this presentation, we wanna help you be able to identify them and then help you be able to recognize them and also help be able to protect them in our parks because the human impact has a tremendous effect on them. And um, so that's really what struck me the last couple years as I'm learning and delving more into this species. But in the last 24 hours, as I was preparing for this presentation, 
the thing that really, really struck me was the symbolism of the eagles, because this is our nation's symbol. And that is very significant. So for, you know, it's on our dollar bills and our coins, it's it's on our logos, it's on the on our on the president's flags. So the this image is prevalent in our nation. And at one time we almost lost the bald eagles. So to have this I, I don't know, our our it's the, the symbolism to me is very significant. And it's not just USA, because if you look back, um, you know, the Native Americans used the bald eagle as uh, a, a big part of their symbolism. It was like a, maybe a spiritual connection that they had with, with the eagles or they would use the image like on their totem poles or, you know, and then before that was um, the uh, ancient Greeks used the, the, the eagles as part of their symbolism. So uh, it's been worldwide and throughout time that eagles have been, have been used as symbols to convey you know, um, either bravery or wisdom or, you know, all these different uh, messages that, you know, that the, the, that nation was using them for. And I challenge you to do some research after we're done with this and look up symbolism of bald eagles, you know, for the United States. Why do we have it? Why do we use it as part of our um, our nation symbol. Why does USA use it? And who else used it? And why? And why was it important to the Native Americans? So, uh, to me, that was it's absolutely fascinating. Hey, Aaron. Um, so we have a lot of questions that are coming in. So I was hoping that we might be able to tackle a few um, now before they uh, log up too much. So if you don't mind, um, Graham had wrote in and he asked. How many eagles are in Ohio? And of those, how many are breeding? And I know we recently did a, a citizen science survey to count the number, number of eagles. So can you um, elaborate on that? I can. And I've got a slide here. Let's see. Um, they ha In 1979, there were only four nests in Ohio. So if you think about that, 1979, not very long ago, there was only four nests and the eggs were not surviving. So they were on the critically endangered in spe species list. Um, and since then, we took eggs from the Cincinnati Zoo and placed them in those four nests. So now we have populated, I'm looking here on my slide, we have 700 and some nests. Let me, let me see where my slide. 707. Yeah, 707 nests. And uh, so you can do a, a Google search, or I don't know how to share this screen, but you can actually see per county how many nests there are per county. So in Warren County, we have four nests right now that are documented. And uh, they're, they're all around us. Let's see. And do you know how many are breeding? Do they all breed every year? Or can you elaborate on that? They do breed. So the, 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 the number that we mentioned there, those are the breeding pairs and um, they have one one brood per year they can possibly have two if the nest is destroyed or something they'll go to you know if they have time they'll make a second one but usually they'll have one to three babies each year so and that actually leads into uh, our next question how long does an eagle normally stay in the same nest 
OK, that's a great question. The eagles stay in the same nest um, for their life. As long as the nest is protected and a good safe area for them. There have been nests that have been abandoned even with the eggs or the babies in them, which is unfortunate because, uh, you know, they were disturbed unknowingly. There was human activity that got too close and the, the eagles abandoned the nest. So that's an eye opener for me. Um, but they'll stay in the same nest for their lifetime and they mate for life. OK, and um, lots of questions, so I'm going to just keep rattling them off. Um, so is there any um, way to know how many eaglets are in a nest? Um, any kind of tracking that ODNR does? So I know we talked about the nest, but um, is there any more you know, in-depth tracking on the eaglets? Yes, we do have um, citizen scientists that go out and they monitor the nests. So if if you're interested in doing that, contact your your local Division of Wildlife office and, and let them know because there is some training. You know, there's there's very particular things that we need to follow in doing so, but we do have some some monitors, citizen scientists, and um, I would like to recognize Bill Sheeman. So in our area, that's who, who, who my main contact is. He'll, he'll go and monitor the different nests and he writes up a report letting us know, you know, how many eagles he has observed and then just kind of what he's seeing, you know, as they grow. And then once they fledge, how many survived and, and that type of thing. So, and ODNR, um, does uh, aerial studies where they're in the helicopter and they'll go around, but they can't see the the babies per se. They're just seeing the nests. Okay, and what's the range of an eagle? Um, and do they migrate or do they stay here all year? They stay here all year, um, and their nesting sites, their their area, their habitat is is important. I mean, very, very important. So um, they'll stay around the area. <clears throat> and one of our trails is closed, you know, because we're it's their habitat area. And I've had people say, well, you know, they're not sitting on the nest right now. Well, that's true. But the you know, there's seasons of courtship and like October, November, they're starting to rebuild their nest back up. And then December, January, you know, now they're really starting to court. And uh, March, they'll, or like late February, March, they'll lay their eggs. So all year round, they're, they're here. Okay, and we have um, Eagle Extraordinaire who's wrote in with a couple questions. He is curious, why are bald eagles called bald? And how do you tell a male from a female bald eagle? OK, they call them bald. That was the the word back in the day for the white, the white head. Um, and sorry, what was the last part of the question? Um, how do you tell a male from a female? OK, then um, females are much larger, so they look similar. And again, once you start watching them and observing them, you'll you'll notice slight variations in, in their features, but they look very similar, males and females, but the females are larger if you sit them side by side. Um, and actually, kind of kind of on that same note, Melanie wrote in and she said there's much discrepancy on whether or not you can distinguish a male from a female eagle based on the shape of the beak versus only being able to tell by a blood test. Are either of those true? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you on that one. OK, we can look more into that. Um, and let's see, where do the babies go when they leave their nest? That's from a question from Amy. OK, um, they 
they'll stay around the nest area for a while. So probably June or July, the, the babies are so big. The eagles are so big. And like I said, you can, it's hard to describe how big they are unless you're like up on them. I, I was at Houston Woods and someone brought in a, a, an injured bald eagle. And that was my first time like actually being touching one. And it's amazing. So there are, these huge birds are up in the nest. And then when the babies fledge, uh, it's a probably July or so, and then they'll they'll stay really close for a while because they're actually just learning how to fly. And sometimes they'll even be sitting on the ground and they're very vocal. So uh, they and they make that beep, 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 beep noise. You know, it's not like what you see in the movies where the opening scene of this movie and that, you know, the, the, the sound is usually the red tail hawk, but um, they're very vocal. The babies will stick really close to the nest. Sometimes they're even on the ground right underneath of the nest. So if you're out canoeing or boating and you see one on the ground, just please, please, please give them their space. That's very important because they, the babies will stay right around the nest until they, they get their wings, their sea legs a couple months, you know, go by probably um, August, I'd say. And then they, they fly off. And then I have seen the juveniles from last year flying around the nest now. So I, they're around. Okay. Um, and we have a question from Bradley. Thanks, Bradley, for joining us. Do eagles eat at their nest together or do they eat while they're out looking for food? It depends on the season, I guess, or um, when, they're, when they have the, the chicks in the nest, they'll bring the, the food back. It's generally fish. And the nest that we have here uh, actually had a big fishing hook, like a big treble hook hanging off of the side of the nest where the, the, the adult brought the fish up into the nest. And that was a big eye opener to me also, just, you know, cause you can see it with your scope, this great big giant hook hanging off the side of the nest. So if you're a fisherman, please be very careful. Try your very best to get your fishing line. If you have it snagged or something, be very careful if you're fishing and hunting in particular, because we share that those resources, you know, with the wildlife. And um, because they are bringing this food back to their babies. So they do eat at the nest when they have babies there. Otherwise, you know, throughout the throughout the summer or early fall, they'll they'll eat it, I guess, in the tree where they are, wherever. Okay. And um, sorry, we just have so many great questions. I mean, unless you have an objection, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Um, but we have a wonderful question from Sophia. She is five years old. I love that you're joining us today, Sophia. Thanks for being here. And she is curious, where is the largest population in Ohio of bald eagles? So I think that the recent report, um, citizen science report you mentioned, Aaron, broke it down by county and I saw Ottawa County had 90 nests, I believe. So what is it about that habitat that, you know, attracts eagles? Okay, that's a great question. It's it's the watershed. It's the water, the lake, the fish, the food supply. So that's a, you know, a big open area. It has plenty of space for them to to fly and, and be free and have their space. And it's also, um, you know, a, lots of lots of food, lots of fish. And I should have said Ottawa County is by Lake Erie, just for those of you that, that aren't sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so why did the bald eagles almost go extinct? Because they were on the verge of extinction in, in 1978, right? Well, um, in Ohio, there were four nests in 1978, but before that, um, there, they went from about 100,000 nests to 400 nests in the US. 
which is very, very few, like within the United States. And the main problem is uh, being hunted and also the quality of their habitat because we were putting uh, DDT, which is a like a poison for insects. And it took us a while to realize, you know, why like if we're, we're killing these pesky mosquitoes with the spray. And it took us a while to realize that like killing the mosquitoes was actually killing the, the bald eagles because the bald eagles are at the very top of the food chain. So everything that they're eating, you know, if the fish are eating the insects that are poisoned and then the bald eagles are eating the fish that ate the insects that were poisoned, it, the poison kind of travels up the food chain and it, and it condenses in their bodies. So um, I think, you know, the the quality of the of their environment is a huge factor and habitat you know we were uh they need big trees it's usually a sycamore tree where they they'll build, build their nest not always but usually and um farmers i think or or you know sometimes they were being hunted for their feathers so for various reasons but mostly the quality of the environment Okay, and um, Shelby, age eight, she's with us. Thanks, Shelby, for joining. Um, she asks, are there different types of bald eagles? There are different types of eagles. And the reason why we have the bald eagle for our symbol in the United States is because that's the one that's native to the United States. So we also have golden eagles. You know, there's lots of different types in other areas, um, but the bald eagle is one type of eagle and that's the one that's native to the United States. Gotcha. So um, we have so many more questions, but I, I do wanna shift to Catherine um, at Houston Woods State Park for um, a little bit before we come back and answer more of your questions. So Catherine, you are live. Oh, you're muted, Catherine. Quote of 2020, I guess. I'm <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Erin. That was wonderful. Um, we have got some great information to share with you guys about eagles. Um, in particular, our bald eagle, of course. Um, it looks like I could share our uh, PowerPoint if you would like. Um, except it does not look like our share tray is allowing us access um i can see it it's just not in presentation view oh i apologize is there um is there any way that you could just pull it up and i can uh, walk through it a little bit um let's see if jenna can um we will work on that Totally fine, everybody. <laughs> totally fine. What I would love to share with you first then is something pretty amazing and special to Houston Woods. Um, if you have not been to Houston Woods State Park, which I understand we're a little bit in the southwest here, but the thing we're really known for is our birds of prey and our birds, ex uh, birds of prey exhibit. So what visitors would see when they come to our nature center is not only inside displays, but they do get to go around outside to see live birds of prey that have either gone through our raptor rehab center or another rehab center throughout the state or country and are deemed unreleasable. They can't go back out into the wild for some reason or another. And you guys get to see a variety of hawks, owls, vultures, falcons, those other types of birds of prey or raptors that you would see here in Ohio. And something we are very proud and know is a crowd pleaser is Abigail, our bald eagle. So if I can shift my computer here, you guys will get to see Abigail. Abigail is a female bald eagle. Is that close enough or should I bring computer a little bit closer, ladies? Um, Either or, I mean, I can, I can see her, but if you could bring it closer, 
you know. Let's see what we can do here. Closer view is always better. <laughs> All right. So this here is Abigail. Abigail is a little bit of a mature lady. She is over 20 years old. She's about 22 years old and eagles will live a very long time. So in the wild, they can live, typically if they make it past that mature age, they can make it to, thank you, Jenna. Those mature eagles, they make it past that five year, they start that breeding and have their mate. They can make it up to their 20s but birds in captivity tend to have a little bit of a longer lifespan. Uh, their life is much easier now, even though they've gone through something pretty traumatic, like falling out of their nest and breaking a wing, they now have a very, they've healed, their life is me giving them food, they're having a very controlled environment, things are just easier on her, and so she can live over 30 years old here with us, and that's obviously what we are hoping for. Abigail has that very classic, because she is a mature eagle, very classic white head, white tail feathers, and that's what sets her apart from any other raptor species here in Ohio. If you were to see a bird of this size flying and you notice that white head and white tail feather, you know you've got an eagle on your hands. So I did see that Jenna had the PowerPoint. I think that is a little less interesting than Abigail. So why don't we jump to that and then we'll come back to her because I'm going to cover a lot that all deals with her and you can see it up close. Um, I don't I don't see the PowerPoint, Catherine. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Here we Thank go. Thank you, Jenna. Here we go. All right. And I believe I can request control. But if not, I can just tell you that we're going to talk about bald eagles. And the next thing is our kind of introduction, just like I said, who we are, what we're doing here at Houston Woods. There we go. What we are doing here at Houston Woods. Like I mentioned, we are a raptor rehab center. We release those birds of prey after they've gone through our rehab, which is a separate building. So any birds that you see here at the center cannot be released. We also do a lot of educational programs. Erin is a big part of that as well over at Caesar Creek. She's got few raptors as well. So we do a lot of outreach with our birds usually. Uh, and right now we're just outreaching virtually. But we do go to school groups, um, retirement communities, all sorts of different things to be able to showcase these birds. And that's just a few off kind of a little bit about myself and Sean Connor, our other naturalist here at Houston Woods State Park. But you've heard Aaron say it, you've heard me say it. What is a raptor? What is a bird of prey? A raptor and a bird of prey have a lot of uh, basically three things that you need to know that mean raptor. She gets it. Being a raptor, you've got these characteristics of a sharp curved beak. Now that sharp curved beak is used to grab and pull apart their food, which we'll talk about here in a minute. They've got those talons. Talons are used for grabbing because that is being a bird of prey. They use their feet to get their food. I cannot tell you how many pictures get shown to me of myself holding a bird going like this because that's such a big deal for them. They're going to use those sharp talons to grab that food. And then the other thing that all raptors have in common is their eyesight. They have amazing vision to be able to see their food. Um, it's been recorded that a bald eagle can see food as small as a rabbit running at three miles per hour, which as a little bunny is pretty fast, be able to see that, use those talons, and grab that food. And this next slide, I've already covered a lot of, and so is Erin. It's what exactly you're looking for for that eagle. You're looking for that white head, you're looking for that tail feather, but also, and especially these days, you want to have that eagle wingspan. They have a wingspan of over six feet sometimes. That is huge. That also keeps you a safe distance from other people. But that six foot wingspan helps them glide, fly, not only over water. Yes, that's a big part of their habitat, which we'll mention here in a minute, but they're also on land too. I see them all the time in cornfields. So they're gliding and flying. And Aaron mentioned that the way that they fly is a little bit different than other birds because vultures do have a different wingspan. Offspray have a different wingspan. But what's pretty neat and sometimes hard with identifying eagles is they don't always look the same. They don't always have that white head and white tail. They don't get that until they're five years old. 
And this is a wonderful image. And I look back at this all the time because when I see an eagle, I try to guess how old it is if I can. Um, when they're born, they are not that pretty white and brown color. They're kind of a mottled mix of colors. And as they age, it is pretty neat to see them progress and get darker and darker. And something that can really trick you is when they're about two years old, they've got this brown line along their eye. And you think, brown line, why is that important? Because offspray have the same thing. That is another big, large bird of prey that flies around our waterway. And so that can be a misidentifying feature. What's really neat about our birds of prey is that habitat and where they're going to be. But until they're that mature age, you really don't know where they're going to be because they don't have a nest or a general location that they want to stay at. In fact, we had a bald eagle visit us um, for three years. Um, and you could tell it was the same eagle because of the way its color changes were happening. And the other really neat thing was it came around the same date every year. I have the pictures that I'll show you guys later saved on my phone and the dates are the same day or one day apart for that eagle's visit. And coincidentally, that eagle was visiting on top of Abigail's cage. So she kind of had a buddy there for a little while looking down at her going, what are you doing in there? How are you getting the free food? But I mentioned there are some similar species and kind of what makes it hard for people to kind of identify eagles. So in Ohio, bald eagles are definitely the one you're going to see most prevalent or most frequently, but on the very rare occasion, and it's very exciting when it happens, you can see a golden eagle. Um, and golden eagles look a lot like a juvenile bald eagle. In fact, the photo on the right is a juvenile bald eagle. Some characteristics that set them apart is golden eagles are a little bit bigger and you really aren't gonna get to know a size difference for an eagle unless you work with one every day or you get them this close view from you and you kind of guesstimate and do some measurements. You're not gonna do that. You wanna look for some other things. You wanna look for some coloration on their feathers. And if you got your binoculars, look closely because a lot of the feathers on a golden eagle have a tip that kind of echoes that gold color. And that is not going to be found on a juvenile bald eagle. Their white and browns are gonna be dull colors. Another similar species I mentioned is the osprey. And osprey not only have that brown line that makes them misidentified for eagles, they're also fish eaters. Um, if you've never watched an osprey eat, you need to look that video up. The way they tuck their wings in, soar into the water and grab that fish and come up is amazing. Eagles tend to more just stay on the shallows of the water and grip and grab food, not actually dive underneath. But with that flying over the water, it can kind of maybe jostle you a little bit. Look for the wing shape. So with Osprey, they have a more bent wing. Bald eagles, straight out wings. And this here is another thing that bald eagles can get misidentified for, and it's not our fault. It is just played in movies all the time. And so people misidentify this call Oh man. Misidentify this call That's the bald eagle call. My sidekick played me the bald eagle call instead of the red-tailed hawk call. That's what you're supposed to be hearing. It is not as graceful and as beautiful as the uh, red-tailed hawk call. And that's really what you're gonna see in most old westerns or even sometimes I noticed on some Animal Planet shows they misplay that call. So I apologize that the videos don't have the sound that I wanted, but you got to hear what the bald eagle sounds like. And it's pretty neat for us here. Um, We've got the bald eagle call, you got to hear that. And it's neat to watch her because she will jerk back her head and really let you hear her call. So even though you can't hear it, you see how she is going to be calling. She's looking around and you'll notice she has a very delicious fish, which was donated by our Division of Wildlife. Whenever they have to do a survey out here at Houston Woods or around the area, they will save the fish that they have to collect and bring them out to us to be used for birds for 
our uh, for our raptors. So with that beautiful call that she has, there she goes. All right, let's move on to our next slide here, which is going to be me not figuring out how to pause a video. I'm not the best technology person, so I apologize, everybody. But let me see if I can move on here. Or, there we go. So we mentioned that fish are a major, major role in their diet. But the thing is, and I absolutely love this line, and I'm stealing it from Sean here, vulture, uh, they're basically glorified vultures or vultures with better PR is how I believe it was told to me. Uh, and that's the truth. Bald eagles are actually kind of scavengers. They will find stuff on the side of the road. They will find stuff out in cornfields that have uh, fallen and can be easy, nice food. And that is actually what I see them eating the most. It is wonderful to get to see them catch that food from the lake. But also if they don't have to put in the effort or actually chance themselves, they're going to do it. So if they can steal food from a vulture, they're fine with it or any other sadly smaller bird than them. The other thing we need to talk about is the habitat. So they're not only around the lakes, they're going to be all over the United States. And like Aaron mentioned, they are the only bald eagle that is or well eagle that is only in North America. And that is one of the reasons that bald eagles were kind of thought of as maybe a potential candidate for our nation symbol. So these are the actual pictures I took on top of our old eagle cage of the same eagle coming back year after year. And unfortunately, if you can tell from this newer image, he is starting to get his kind of white head and this year he did not come back. And I think he has found himself a mate in probably his own area. And uh, I think very hopeful that he has a very happy life now. And Abigail no longer has uh, her buddy to come back and see her. Or more rather, uh, somebody to yell at and say, hey, get off my, my home. What is pretty neat though, is so say that eagle did find its mate. They are monogamous, so that eagle does stay together their entire lives unless something does happen. And the way that they actually go about um, getting together is pretty neat. Uh, courtship, if you will, they are ritual in the sky. And I would love to show you this because what happens is they're going to, and you'll see it, they're going to grab each other and basically free fall. And at the very last second, separate themselves. So enjoy. Oh. <laughs> and I think that is a lesson that we can all learn that it takes a little bit of practice to be a good partner. And my partner over here just mentioned, it's really like they're holding hands and then they fall and separate and then come back together to uh, do some other things. Be more friendly, if you will. With our next slide here, which I apologize, once they've gotten together, that bald eagle nest is really special. The size of it, the amount of time they spend on it, it's crazy. The largest eagle nest can be found in Florida, and it is over nine feet deep. It is a huge nest. It weighs thousands of pounds. And as Aaron mentioned, they come back year after year to this same nest and build it. And I thought it was kind of funny because the female kind of stays at the nest area. The male goes out and finds branches, brings them back to her, and then she places them where they belong on the nest. She's kind of the architect of everything. She knows where it belongs. But what is also neat is it is teamwork. So bald eagles are one of the species, like I said, that will stay together, but they also share roles. So both the female and the male will take turns laying on the nest, and the other one will then go out and find food, not only for itself, but sometimes for its partner or for its young fledglings, which is really neat as well. So I mentioned the size of them. Um, and the reason they need to be that big 
is birds of prey grow so fast. So when you look up at a nest with eagles, it's pretty easy because you can see that those babies look different. But with other birds of prey, uh, they don't always look different. So you can see a nest of fully grown owls or hawks. And it's like, why are they all there? Some of them are babies. So eagles can have maybe four, not really five, but usually typically four or less babies. And that's four plus two adults all sharing one nest. They have to be big. That is a nest uh, that we have here at Houston Woods that people can jump in. I know other nature centers around the state have a bald eagle nest that you can jump in and sit in and see kind of what it would be like to be an eagle and kind of see, hmm, maybe we need to work on this and make it a little bit bigger. So she mentioned the endangered species and the DDT and really how impactful that was. I wanted to share this with you guys because if you're watching and you want to know how many nests are in your county, there you go. The Division of Wildlife did a tremendous job getting volunteers, uh, some of their own staff to go out and count these nests. Um, it is such a successful story, not only for eagles, but all of our birds of prey because that insecticide, DDT, and other very harmful pesticides not only disrupted their lives, but also other birds of prey. And what it did to the eagle and to all birds of prey is it didn't kill them when it was ingested. What it did to that eagle is make the shell of its egg less firm. And so when an eagle or another bird of prey would lay an egg, it would actually sit on it and break its own egg. So they weren't able to repopulate themselves fast enough before it was almost too late. They are a very great success story for our endangered species and really kind of the idea of we need to watch what we're doing and think outside of ourselves and what we are impacting. And uh, that is just a graph from um, as well, not only Division of Wildlife, but US Fish and Wildlife Services kind of showing when the eagles were put on the endangered species list back in the late 60s and early 70s, what was happening. In Ohio, there were only four nesting pairs and that's how they're counted. They're not counted by single eagles, they're counted by their nests. And so across the United States, there are only 487 nests. Think in your mind, that's less nests than we have in Ohio right now. And then after the 2000s, they stopped counting as much because in the, um, oh, what was it? It was 2007, they were taken off of the endangered species list. And then 2012, taken off Ohio's, Ohio State endangered list. And so after the 2000s, there's not as much count on them until now when the Division of Wildlife did their survey. I uh, mentioned that the history of our nation symbol, but the thing is, is it's also kind of a misconception. Um, everybody wants to talk about our beautiful bald eagle and how they decided that that was our nation symbol. It was kind of just stumbled upon. Um, it was committee after committee after committee couldn't decide what our nation symbol was going to be. And so basically the last committee went, hmm, They've all got good ideas and good points. Let's mash it all together. And that's how we got the eagle, the olive branch. Um, ben Franklin was thanked for the rattlesnake on our, um, what is it, tread or die? Join or die flag, that's it. Um, but it was kind of everybody brought together. But the big misconception here that I wanna talk about is Ben Franklin, um, very obviously famous guy. But everybody wants to talk about how he wanted the wild turkey to be the nation's symbol. And the more you dive into it and read and read, which is really important, make sure you're educating yourselves out there, because not everything people tell you is true. So Ben Franklin didn't actually stand up in this committee and say, oh, the turkey should be it, the wild turkey, red, white, and blue. Those are all myths. The real thing is, is it was found later in his life, a letter to his sister or daughter, it was a letter to his daughter, just said, I don't really believe that this was the right choice. Um, bald eagles are these kind of aggressive, um, basically over publicized bird. It might as well just have the wild turkey on there. So it wasn't that he was a huge fan of the wild turkey or he had a big plan behind it. It was just something that he wrote to his daughter and has been blown up into something. But you mentioned, and I mentioned, that you really need to educate yourself and think about what you're doing. 
really be conscientious when you're going out. Erin mentioned it and she did an amazing job of telling you that what you do matters and how you act around eagles matter. Uh, this is actually myself and one of my very best friends, Emily. Um, we were lucky enough to spot a pair of eagles just out fishing and we kept our distance. You can notice it's not that good a picture of the eagle. We are at our distance. We are respecting that eagle and that's the biggest thing, whether they're nesting, whether they're just out fishing and whether it's an eagle or another species in wildlife. Nobody wants to be encroached on their personal space. Keep your distance. Be respectful. Don't tease. Don't yell. Don't try calling or anything to this. Just sit there, stand there, watch an eagle be an eagle. I have a few um, educational resources that you guys can take a peek at if you have some time. Just some really great sites. The Division of Wildlife, I cannot push them enough because they are so wonderful and they do so much for our community. Please go ahead and take a look at them. Also our Wildlife, uh, National Wildlife Federation, and then our National American Eagle Foundation as well. But I have talked way longer than I should have. Let's go back to that eagle. So I am going to shut down this PowerPoint. Thank you. And we are going to go back over here to Abigail, who has been super calm and happy. I mentioned she is an older bird. I mentioned that she has those characteristics. She's got that beautiful curved beak, if you can see it. And we are just very, very fortunate to have her here. She is very vocal, so if you make your way out to Houston Woods or even like us on our Facebook page, if you can't make it out, we post videos of her all the time. She loves to chat and she is definitely um, a species to get to see here. Look at her showing off for you guys. Hey, and Catherine, you notice, speaking of um, coming to see the birds, Somebody just asked, is uh, is it open? Can people come see them now? That is a tremendous question. And we are very fortunate that we are. So inside enclosures or an inside nature center is closed. Outside our exhibits are open. So you can walk around our building. There are hand sanitizer stations set up. There's reminders to keep your distance. We have it set up as one way traffic. But the thing is, it is up to you guys to keep your own safety and to follow those rules that we have put out. Please, please think of yourself and others. And if there's another family maybe viewing the birds, take your turn and then go up and see them. Are there any other questions, Alyssa? Abigail would be happy to answer them. <laughs> there are so many questions. Um, let's see, so how would Abigail stay warm in the winter? Oh, excellent question. And a chance for me to shout out to my very beloved mom and dad, who I'm sure are watching. One of the things we have put in her enclosure is a box. And people think, oh, just a box. She loves her box. What the box does is it gives her a space to get out of that wind chill. So bald eagles are a species that are here year round. So she is used to this kind of chillier time that we're having. That being said, her enclosure, um, not only has a heated or has a box, but if it does get cold enough, we bring her inside into a little bit of a more warmer controlled environment. But honestly, she kind of loves the cold. It's more the heat you have to worry about with your birds. She is definitely one of our birds that will show off and take a bath in front of everybody in the summertime and thoroughly and I'm just talking about it and she's getting excited. Thoroughly enjoys our sprinklers as well. And if she was wild, um, how would she keep warm? So what is pretty neat about the way birds feathers work is out in the wild, what they would do is, and it's pretty funny to see because it looks like a bird's about to explode, but they will puff up their feathers and they puff up their feathers to allow air to come up underneath of it. And they will then lay those feathers down on top of that air. And what that does is it creates a little kind of like warm pockets on their body and that will help regulate their temperature. Birds of prey are in all birds are warm blooded and that means they're just like us. They have a temperature that they need to keep up and so they do. They need to create kind of neat ways to keep themselves warm, including maybe eating a little more food. OK, so we have we have tons of questions. We're going to try to get to them before we end here. We might go a little bit over our hour. 
And Aaron, please feel free to jump in if you need if you uh, want to answer any of these. So um, I'm just going to keep rattling them off. <laughs> Go for um, it. Rapid fire. Right. What are the predators of bald eagles in Ohio? We had a few questions about this and somebody even got a little bit more specific and asked if there's predators of the eggs in Ohio. Awesome question. And that's probably what bald eagles have to be more conscientious about. One, do you see this bird? Um, she actually comes up to my waist size. They're very tall birds and they're very strong birds. So there's not really a predator so much as people. So there are instances where bald eagles, because they're so focused on their food, can go into traffic, but otherwise there's no top predator for them. Their eggs, however, if they're not careful, there are egg eating species in Ohio, like raccoons, um, snakes, but that's way too big of an egg. Um, but also you gotta think that is one raccoon that has to be pretty gutsy because really probably end up being food itself. <laughs> so I I'd like to add in something really quick. He she did mention people as predators. I don't, we don't do it on purpose. You know, people are not out to, to kill a bald eagle for sure. But if you're out hunting or fishing or recreating in the park, you have to be very uh, conscientious is a great word of, of what you're doing. Because if you're fishing, um, it's important to not use lead if you can, like on your sinkers because lead poisoning is a, is a big problem with the eagles, you know, and of course that's because of human impact. And uh, that comes from hunting also, you know, if you have buckshot or something and there's lead that gets in, you know, and, and the animal is out there like, like a squirrel or whatever. And then the, the eagle eats that, he's ingesting the lead uh, or, you know, the fish hooks and pesticides that we're putting out into the environment. And uh, the clean water is just vital. So our, we talk about our watershed, you know, what we're putting into our water. So uh, we're not pre preying on them, you know, to harm them on purpose, but it just happens. So we have to make conscious choices because the, the human impact is the, the one of my biggest takeaways with this study. Um, did you have something, Catherine? I, oh. I did. So, okay, I saw you raise um, your hand. <laughs> so people just now get to see Abigail, but that's not the only bald eagle that we've cared for. Um, unfortunately, we lost Baldy, um, one we did not pick the name, um, to old age just a few years ago, but he had lead poisoning. So you could actually see the effect that that had on him. He had, um, his walk was kind of wobbly. He couldn't fly straight you'd notice a glint in his eye. So like Aaron said, it is very impactful, but it's the same thing. We really value our hunters, but education is key. Make sure you're doing everything as a responsible birder, as a responsible hunter, responsible recreator all across the board. Okay, and we, we had um, somebody ask, how many eagles have you rescued? So that is a great question and kind of a miss miss a little bit. So we are a small raptor center, a rehab center. So usually when we help a bald eagle, we transport it to another facility. We don't have um, basically the cages large enough for an eagle. We care for vultures and under. And so we have helped our wildlife officers a couple times uh, capture some bald eagles because they are large and powerful birds, but we then safely return them to another rehab center. Um, okay, and then Hudson, he has been very patient. He wants to know how many feet is Abigail's wingspan? So thank you for your question, Hudson. That is perfect. So what is pretty fun is the picture that I showed you guys of the two little kids holding their wings out. That graphic was taken from her wingspan. We were very fortunate to have the Cincinnati Museum Center come in take images of her wings and then display them on something for people to get to see. So she has a six foot wingspan, exactly. Wow. And one side's a little bit shorter because it has a little break in it. It's healed, but that's just her injury. She cannot fly anymore. Um, and do, do juveniles build their own nests to live in before they are mature enough to breed? So that is a big misconception, I think, with birds as a whole is that birds and nests, that's what everybody groups together. 
birds aren't always on nests and aren't always with nests. And so no, uh, typically juveniles will not build nests. What they need to do is become that pair and then they kind of take that next step into their life. And even when they're mature adults, they don't stay at that nest all year round, which is kind of neat because then you can go view that nest when there's you know no eagles around and see kind of how it changes through the seasons. Interesting. Um, OK, so so we are at 11 a.m. Um, thank you for everybody that's joined us. We are going to keep answering. You know that you can go to our YouTube page, um, go to YouTube and search Ohio DNR, and this will be posted next week. But um, oh, Abigail is beautiful. <laughs> Sue's asked, she's a, um, she's a pretty lady. Yeah. Suze asks, do you band in Ohio? Oh, bird banding is such a great thing if you get to be a part of it. Um, so typically it's not happening right now. We here at Houston Woods do have uh, bird banding within the park through Miami University. Um, their professor and ornithologist comes out, partners with us in the park to kind of see the population as well as educate their students, but that's not just Houston Woods. Everywhere has that opportunity. Just look into your local area and your birding groups. Okay, and how long does the bald eagle live? This is from Grayson, age six. Well, hello Grayson. So Abigail here is 22, but in captivity she will live to over 30 years old. In the wild, they will live to be about 20, so just about her age. And how fast can eagles fly slash dive? That's from I cannot believe I didn't say that. Bald <laughs> eagles are so fast. They can reach speeds of about 100 miles per hour when they are diving. See, she's fast diving after her food. Just regular flight straight across is going to be about 30 miles per hour, which in the bird world is about the same kind of speed that an owl would fly down towards their food. Owls are notoriously slow flyers, but it's still fast. And we had another question kind of related. Uh, bald eagles rule, I love the name. Um, this person wrote in and asked, how do bald eagles glide? Ooh, so that is a great question. And bald eagles, beautiful name. Not only do they have that white head, we have to thank the, the French because bald is white in, in French. But the way they glide is just the way, and she's showing it off really well right now, is the way her feathers are positioned and how they overlap and how they are constructed. Eagles and all birds of prey, the design of their body are made to be fast flying, soaring birds. So for a bird of prey, not only that sharp beak is designed for her, those talons, her eyesight, everything she is, is so she can be that bird of prey. Um, and we have Kinsley, age six. Thanks for your question, Kinsley. Um, and they asked, how many miles can an eagle fly? And this was a, a question from some other folks too. So thanks to the rest of you, Rodin. Absolutely, thanks everybody. So eagles and other birds of prey can really travel a great distance in one day, um, many miles. I don't think there is a, a max miles that they can go. The thing that you do wanna keep in mind though is most of that time is going to be spent during the day. So great eyesight does have a little bit of a downfall for these uh, hawks and eagles and falcons is they don't have a good night vision. So usually by dusk, they're gonna wanna find a location for themselves to kind of hang out and stay comfortable for the night. And that leads perfectly into our next question. How far can bald eagles see? Ooh, so with a bald eagle, it's not so much a distance as it is um, speed and how quick something can see something. Um, so I always use the analogy of a rabbit because that is the perfect size food for a bald eagle. If they are running at their top speed, which is about three miles per hour, a bald eagle perching or sitting high in the sky can still see that rabbit moving. So not only see like a glimpse of something, they know it's a rabbit. Hmm, interesting. Um, and Arden wrote in with a couple questions. Are there any differences in baby eagle beaks and adult beaks? More specifically, how do the beaks change from black to yellow? So what's pretty neat about not only eagles is that they do, they can go through a color change and it's just kind of age and their diet and things like that. 
But what I'd love to touch on with not only beaks, but talons as well, is what they're made out of. So as they're growing, it's not the same beak that they had when they were a baby. So beaks and talons are constantly growing because they're made out of keratin, which is the same thing as our fingernails. And so it's constantly growing. And what they do to kind of combat that is she, and she does a great job of it. She will rub her beak on branches, on rocks, on the bones of her food to kind of, kind of uh, grind that down a little bit as she's growing to keep it sharp. Same thing with her talons, and she's gonna grip onto that food. So something interesting as far as the color change is that their eyes also change colors. And this is pretty common throughout uh, hawks, like red tail hawks will do the same thing. So I believe when the bald eagles are babies, their eyes are pretty dark. And then when once they're adults, they're just golden yellow. And so that's interesting. And at the red tail hawks, when they're born, they have like, a, uh, are they very chocolate brown, Catherine? So, and then they um, to a lighter color as they get older, too. Yeah, same with the eagles. So, uh, with oh, sorry, Alyssa. Nope, that's all right. Go ahead. I was just going to mention, yeah. Um, and that's the thing with birds of prey is there is a lot of overlap. So, with red tailed hawks, their eyes do change color as they get older. They start out as a very beautiful gold color, and as they get older, they turn into that darker, darker color. Um, it's okay. actually when they come to our rehab center, sometimes an hawk is not acting quite right to people and what it is is their eyes are so dark we know that they're kind of towards the end of their life and they were just ready hmm. and so they were acting a little strange because of that and that leads to another question um eagle extraordinaire who is with us today uh asked if eagles and hawks are in the same family so they are related. So um, kind of the bird of prey that's the outlier here in Ohio is going to be your vultures. Vultures are not true birds of prey. If you notice their feet and beak are not actually designed to catch food. They are strictly carrion eaters. So really your hawks, owls, vulture, or excuse me, falcons are more closely related. Okay, and Melissa had a great question. If you find an eagle feather, is it legal to keep it? That is a tremendous question, and thank you for asking before actually collecting. Uh, it is not. So, and it's not just eagles. All bird feathers, nests, par parts of a bird are illegal to keep. Uh, they are protected from our Migratory Species Act, and the only exceptions to that is going to be kind of your upland game species. So like a wild turkey, um, non-native species, those are your really only um, feathers that you could keep. Um, and then something else to mention too with the feathers is sometimes it's hard to figure out what a feather is. And so if you don't know, just leave it be because some birds will use feathers for other things. They can use it to build more nests and things like that. So if it's in nature, sometimes it's best to just leave it in nature. From what I understand with the with the feathers, and we talked about the symbolism um, at the beginning of the presentation, it, the Native Americans can get bald eagle feathers because it's a very symbolic uh, thing for them. So it they would often pray and hold the uh, a bald eagle feather because, as we mentioned, Native Americans they would use the bald eagle as their symbol. Um, as kind of the connection between the creator and their people because it flies the highest in the sky. So it was kind of like the messenger between, you know, the two entities. So the symbolism, you know, the, the United States nation symbol and the Native Americans use it as a symbol and the ancient Greeks use it as a symbol and all these cultures all the way across the world and all throughout time is to me, the most fascinating thing that I've discovered in the last 24 hours. It's, I, I challenge you to go out and, and read some more about that. Catherine? Erin uh, is definitely correct. Yes, Native Americans can collect uh, feathers. However, I don't want everybody out there to think that they can just go grab feathers. You do need to have special permission and permits for that still. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we had a couple of questions uh, similar to this. 
So um, how can eagles survive in harsh conditions? We did talk about, you know, how they stay warm, but I didn't know if there's anything more to elaborate on that. So it really goes into how a bird of prey is designed. These birds are made for conditions. They are made for those high winds. They are made for those rain. One, she loves the rain. If you see a bird in the rain, they're not miserable. They're loving it. Um, they are made for their environment. So a lot of people like to put personal characteristics to animals and the way we feel is not the way that they always feel. And so you really have to think that she is designed to be outside living, grabbing, catching that food in all conditions. Her eyes are designed, even if she's on a high moving branch, to see that food still and to be able to get it and help sustain her life. Okay, and a um, couple questions here. Um, someone wrote in and said, my neighbor seen an increased has seen increased activity. Do we need to be worried about them taking small dogs or cats? And how far does an eagle go from their nest to hunt? So that is an excellent question and a very understandable worry. Um, so I mentioned, and Aaron did as well, that DDT, that was not just happening to eagles. There was an impact on all birds of prey. So not only eagles are making a great comeback, but I don't know about you, but I can't leave my house without seeing a red tail talk. Our birds of prey are coming back tremendously and very, very small prey does happen, but you have to think a bird like this and a hawk are not going to be eating any food larger than their own body weight. And so for a hawk, that's the most common problem we see is people calling a red-tailed hawk only weighs roughly three pounds, maybe three and a half um, for a large female. And so if your dog or cat is heavier than that, you're okay. However, you got to think she weighs close to 13 pounds and she has a predator. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people, because I have a neighbor um, who has a very, very small um, dog. Hi, Mrs. McFarland. Um, I tell her, and she, she listens, her and her husband, one of them always goes out with their small dog because that's not going to happen with a person standing right beside them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and what, what season do eagles breed during? Okay, so that is awesome. So it's going to be our kind of late winter, early spring is when all the good activity is going to be happening. They're not going to kind of go off the nest until about May, and that's when you can start to see them, especially, I bet Caesar Creek is beautiful, Houston Woods at Acton Lake is great. They're going to stay around the water then, so you can actually get a pretty good look at the juveniles because they're not good at hunting yet, so you just get to hear them cry for their mom and dad to come and feed them. So they're not going to be nesting until after February. We usually say that great horned owls are the first nesters, which is in mid to late February. So after them, everybody else kind of gets on board and goes, oh, we should really get to laying some eggs. Okay, <laughs> and it's certainly important during the winter time that if you are out observing them, Again, please use a very high powered scope or maybe just go to one of the Facebook pages like the Carillon Park um, or photos, you know, that people post or a webcam so that you can observe without getting too close because it's, it is during the very cold season. And if they're off of their eggs for too long, the eggs will freeze. There's just a, you know, and once they start getting bigger, if you get too close, you might um, like spook them and then they'll fall out of the nest because it's very crowded in there. So just all year round that that nesting site is is special. To Aaron, them. the segue to the next question could not be more perfect. Um, Suze asks, can people getting too close make the eagle abandon their nest? And what's the law about a nest with eggs? Okay, yes, there there's federal regulations to stay back. Um, and uh, what was the first part of the question? Um, can people getting too close make oh. the eagle abandon the nest? Yes, there has been documentation where there was actually babies in the nest and the adults abandoned because there was human activity that was too close, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. So please be very um, aware, I guess. And you can see them easier in the wintertime because the leaves are gone. You don't want to go looking for a nest like in the spring because you might walk right up 
way too close to not even know it because you can't see it because the leaves are on the trees. So the winter time is by far the, the easiest time to see, but you wanna bring a high powered scope or maybe look at a webcam and, and don't disturb them off that area. And how long do the baby eaglets stay with their mother? I see the juveniles hanging around. Um, so, uh, you know, last year we had three that fledged. The year before that we had three. The year before that we had two. So, as Catherine showed, the different um, as they grow, between one and five years, they're all brown. But you can see they're molting, changing. So they they'll hang around. I, I see. I saw a juvenile yesterday. You know, one from last year, I suppose. They're they're not feeding off of the parents anymore. They're not like dependent. They're not on the nest, but they're around. And do either of you know what the Kenzie asked what the biological reason for the eaglets being fluffy and different having the different color is? Probably camouflage and also warmth. The that down feather, you know, is um, very warm for the parents and and uh, takes the heat well from the mother. Yeah. Um, OK, and we, I'm going through questions. Let's see, we, we went over what they eat. Um, which is bigger, the bald eagle or the golden eagle? Golden eagle. OK, um, and let me just make sure we didn't miss any questions because we don't want to um, want to ignore any. Uh, how big is their territory from their nest for hunting purposes? That's a good question and I think it varies on how many how many eagles are in the area. So if you go down to Florida or say up to Lake Erie, you're going to find more eagles per square mileage. But you know here uh, where there's less their their territories are going to be bigger so it kind of depends on where you are okay and i think that one last question and i i hope we answered them all um pam from grand lake st mary's thanks for joining she asks if their mate died oh i don't know if we should end on this it's a sad question <laughs> <laughs> if their mate dies will they find another or remain alone They'll find another mate, and I think that that goes back to the the symbolism of the eagle. They are very strong. They're they're known for their endurance, um, for their will to survive. So if their if their mate does not make it, yes, they generally will. They'll find a way to survive. Okay, not so sad. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining. We enjoyed the questions. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and Abigail, can't forget to thank Abigail there. Um, and if you missed anything today and you want to go back and watch, please go to our YouTube channel. It's Ohio DNR and all of our webinars are um, are folk or excuse me, are posted there. So if you missed anything, um, please go and check it out and join us for some future webinars and Happy New Year to everybody. Bye.